It looks best if I'm looking at you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riders or horses and riding from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer. And with me today is a very special guest, Dr. Gretchen Nelson, a veterinary for with an equine practice and my sister. Yes. So we're both Nelsons. <laughs> And Gretchen is my local vet. We happen to live near each other. And no, we didn't grow up in a horsey family. We are just the two oddballs of the family who love horses. And we get to see each other a lot. So I'm excited to have Gretchen, Dr. Gretchen, Dr. Gretchen Nelson, as a um, guest <laughs> on the Horse Geeks podcast today. So welcome, Gretchen. And today's topic is going to be talking about colic. Right, because what are the things with a new horse owner that you cover first? Colic is definitely one of them. Thank you for having me here. And if one owns a horse, one needs to know what colic is, how to recognize it and what to do um, and ways to prevent it. So my number one thing that I tell clients is if your horse is normally a really good eater and you go down to feed them, and they don't want to eat their dinner, the first thing to do is if they're not showing signs of pain, which is usually associated with colic, is to take their temperature as well and see if they're running a fever. So that's how you can kind of differentiate between a colic and maybe a fever from something causing an infection in their body. So now we're going to go the colic route. The classic symptoms are no interest in eating or drinking, oftentimes very restless in their behavior. Some of them will just paw, some of them will stand with their head in the corner. Often they'll lay down and try to roll. Um, but overall it's a zero interest in food and displaying signs of discomfort. A classic symptom for geldings is to park out like they're going to urinate and not. So people always think it's a bladder infection or something like that, or they just can't pee. And it's actually their demonstration of colic pain which colic means abdominal pain. That's all that it means. And there's a ton of different causes for it. So we'll get so into- So the most important thing is, rec yeah, just recognizing that that's what it is. And that's what I was gonna ask because horses will lie down without having colic, mm -hmm. right? So Correct. a horse laying down isn't an immediate, you know, emergency. No. Horses can lay down and often do to sleep because they, that's how they get their full REM sleep is to actually lay down and go into a deep REM. They can sleep standing up, but it's more of getting like a little cat nap. So laying down is not a big issue. The key is the restless behavior. And another kind of classic sign that it's a normal lay down in a sun bath is when they get up, they often shake off the dirt. A colicky horse typically doesn't shake. So they'll get mm -hmm. up and they're sweaty and they're covered with sand and they don't care that they have all this sand stuck on their body because they're more focused on their belly pain. So that's one of the little kind of, you know, things to watch for is that a healthy horse that was just taking a little sun bath will get up and have a good shake. Or if they were just having a good roll in the sand and they get up and shake it off. And usually they'll get up and stay up if they were having a nap or a snooze where a colicky horse will get up and lay down and get up and lay down. But how long can a horse be laying down before you would worry? Because some horses can lay down and quietly colic, but they lay down quietly much longer than they would normally sleep. So how long if you saw your horse laying down before you should start to kind of consider going over there and checking on them? Um, it's a lot of it is knowing your horse. So if you know your horse is one that likes to lay down and take a good snooze, then I'd probably let them rest for a couple hours and not worry about it. Okay. If you're one that you're like, I never see my horse laying down ever. And it's laying down at a time where they don't normally, then the, the easiest thing to do is walk up with some kind of little treat or cookie, or even a little bit of food, ask them to get up, offer them some food. And if they eat it, they're most likely not colicking. Ah, good tip. Okay. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so those are all the symptoms of colic. And let me just recap, like if they're not eating or drinking 
for almost any horse, that's a bad sign, right? And so if you offer their normal food and they don't eat it or they nibble at it or they're not really drinking water and you're monitoring water, take their temperature right away and look for any signs of pain, which could be like pawing in the stall, getting up or down, uh, that kind of thing, or signs of pain like rolling, laying down, not wanting to move, but not um, resting things like that. So those yeah. symptoms, oh, you cut out for a second. Say that again. Sometimes they'll also bite at their side, like where it's painful. Some horses like look back at their belly, you know, when they're laying down and a lot of times they'll moan, they'll lay flat out and moan. Whereas usually when they're resting, they just kind of go down, lay down and take their snooze. I have mm. had a few horses that are good snorers, <laughs> but the is more the restless. You know, that's what you're looking for is that restless behavior. Restless behavior. And I didn't know for geldings, the sort of parking out like they're going to pee, but they're not peeing, but they keep parking out. So what and is, occasionally they'll urinate. Occasionally they'll right. urinate. Occasionally they will urinate small amounts frequently. And that's where a lot of times people will think it's a bladder infection or something. And that's usually gas distended intestine pushing on their bladder. So that's another sign of colic is that gelding that parks out, dribbles a small amount of pee, gets restless, does it again. And oftentimes it's the gas filled colon pushing on the bladder. So they feel they have to urinate frequently. Okay. Much like a pregnant woman with a just pushing on her bladder. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And so let's back up a second and go, what is colic? Like, what is the definition of colic? Because non-horse people only associate that word with babies, colicky babies that are fussy yeah. and, and all that. And so what is colic in a horse? Abdominal pain. That's all it means. So oh, that's, all, that's all it means is abdominal pain. And that is the majority of the time coming from the gastrointestinal tract. But on occasion, it can come from other parts, like if they have a liver infection or occasionally they will get bladder stones. Um, they'll sometimes have like a abscess or something in their abdomen or a fatty tumor. That's it's not necessarily the GI tract itself, but it's impinging on the GI tract. And so that will cause abdominal pain. So that's all that colic means. And there's a lot of different causes of it. And I was going to ask, what are some of the main types of colic or causes of colic? So practicing in Florida, I would have to say my primary causes, I'd say the, the most common cause is a hay impaction. And this is when you get that disruption in the amount of water they drink versus the amount of hay they eat and their intestinal contents get a little too dry and get stuck. We see it most commonly with the fine grass hays like Tifton and Coastal. Um, it's less common with alfalfa and Timothy and things like that and orchard grass, but it can still happen. And it's basically that they've decreased their water intake enough for whatever reason. Um, in Florida, I see it commonly associated with weather changes. So like if we get one of our cold snaps, mm -hmm. they'll often not drink as much water. Um, I'll also see it when we start getting a lot of rain. Um, and I think primarily it's because their body is cooled by the rain and they're just not as thirsty. And so they won't drink as much and the hay that they've eaten has gotten too dry to move through the intestinal tract and get stuck. And that creates an impaction or what's called an impaction colic. Yeah. Okay. And what right. other kind of colics? Because it doesn't always have to be an impaction. No. Um, well, sometimes I will see sand impactions as well. If you've got a horse that consumes an abnormal amount of sand. And in Florida, we live on a sandbar. And so um, most horses will have a trace amount in their intestinal tract. But I've had... A few youngsters, especially like recently weaned babies, and they will just chow down on the sand and get a bunch of it and have to go. Um, if you can't clear it with something like Metamucil, the psyllium and mineral oil, then sometimes they'll have to go to surgery to have all the sand removed. 
Um, and then that leads to other surgical colics include things like strangulating lipomas, where there's a fat tumor that can sometimes wrap around the intestine or just push on the intestine and those have to be removed. Um, displacements, because sometimes their large colon will just kind of kink back on itself or shift around and get stuck in a different part of the body from where it belongs. Like one of the places will be over the ligament that runs between the left kidney and the spleen. And we call that a nephrosplenic as in kidney spleen entrapment where the pelvic flexure flipped itself up over that ligament and has now gotten so filled with gas, it can't come back. Mm -hmm. And that one can be corrected medically, but often requires surgery. And then the worst ones are when the intestine actually twists. And that's what we call a volvulus where it will twist on itself and it can twist 120 degrees, 360, 720. And that is actually cutting off blood flow. And that bowel will get very distended. The abdomen will look very distended. That horse is excruciatingly painful. And same with the strangulating like lipomas. When those wrap around the small intestine, the horse is very, very painful. They'll have very elevated heart rates. It, you can barely get them comfortable with drugs. And so if I can't get them to a point where they're comfortable with um, medications and fluid therapy, then that just tells me it's something surgical. Even if I don't know what it is exactly, surgery is what it's going to take to fix it. Uh, and so they can have basically a, 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 a gas issue that creates the twist or an impaction issue that creates the twist, or they could have um, like a benign tumor that wraps around the intestine, but anything that twists the intestine or cuts off blood flow is going to be a high pain colic that absolutely requires yeah. surgery. The majority of them. So like the nephrosplenic entrapment, one of the techniques you can use for that is to give them a drug called phenylephrine, which causes the spleen to contract, thereby making the space smaller. And then what they'll do is jog the horse with the hopes that the smaller spleen allowing for more space and the trotting motion will help flip that piece of intestine back over the ligament. So they can be resolved medically sometimes, but if that doesn't work, then you got to go to surgery in order to get that intestine back where it belongs. Because otherwise it just, it won't and they'll just stay painful. And there's really, there's no specific causes for twists and displacements. We believe it has to do with normal gut motility and having like a gas cap in the gut that then pulls it and causes it to twist on itself or to go to an abnormal place. But there's no definitive way to know for sure. And it's one of the things that's almost impossible to prevent. It just, I've had clients where they went down, fed their horse dinner, they went in the house and ate dinner, came back an hour later and their horse is throwing itself on the ground and they take it up for surgery and it already has dead bowel. And so mm. it can happen that fast with means of pre preventing it really. But impactions can lead to twists and displacements. Um, and so that's where you want to treat your impaction as early as possible to hopefully prevent that. Um, and so the if, rolling, we don't. But that's what, just what I was going to ask about. Um, if I see colic symptoms and my horse is laying down quietly, or if I see my horse getting up, getting down and rolling and really showing pain symptoms, what's the best thing to do for that? Let them do it? Or is that risking a twist? It's hard to say for sure, but the theory is that the rolling may lead to a twist. And so number one, the first thing that we didn't say, actually, when you see your horse colicking is call the vet. So a lot of people like to treat them themselves with walking, giving them banamine, things like that. I tell my clients, the sooner we treat it, the faster it resolves, the better for everyone, including the horse, specifically the horse. And so I would much rather see a colic sooner than later. So with that advice with my clients, I would say that 90% of the colics I see resolve with one treatment. I come, I sedate them, I give them banamine, 
I do a rectal to ascertain what's going on in the, in the intestinal tract to the best that I can. I pass a nasal gastric tube to see, do I get back fluid spontaneously when I put the tube in place? That tells me the small intestine's not moving and it's building up fluid in the stomach. Um, do I get back more than I put in once I start lavaging? What does it smell like? What does it look like? If the horse hasn't eaten for six hours, does it still have a lot of food in there? Is there a lot of hay? Um, and so those are all the things I'm looking at. And then if everything looks good, I give them some water with electrolytes and some mineral oil, pull the tube, and then they're usually grazing by the time I finish cleaning up my buckets and discussing with the client what the next step is. The 10% ones are going to be split into two categories of they require a second treatment, which may involve IV fluid therapy. If they're really badly impacted, they may need some IV fluids to get rehydrated and get things moving, or they may require surgery. And so I've had both of those where I have to make that second trip sometimes and just give them a little thing, little something extra, or we got to hook up the trailer and go. And if surgery is not an option, then you can try to the best in your, in the field. I'm always willing to try a little bit of IV fluid therapy, some sedation, because I've had some pull through that I didn't think we're going to. Um, and so it's always worth giving it a try, but if that horse is just in constant pain, then the kindest thing to do, in my opinion, then is to euthanize and not put them through that long standing constant pain if you can't get them comfortable. And that's typically your torsions. They just, I've had some where I've sedated them and they just chew through the drugs. Like 10 minutes later, they're throwing themselves on the ground again. And those are the ones that it's like, nope, get them to surgery. Or the heart rate's so. just elevating and not coming back down to normal, which is a sure sign of pain. And so as soon as an owner sees symptoms, you would rather, you would say to any owner, call the vet sooner than later because colic can become life-threatening very quickly. It's a serious issue with a horse. It could be something mild, but better to have the vet out to check it out than to wait too long where you either have a gas buildup or an impact, you have possibly more complicated issues than if you treat it sooner. And so as Correct. soon as somebody calls the vet, is every vet different or is there like a regular, if we have banamine on hand, which is a muscle relaxer, should we go ahead and give that or not give that? Or does that depend on the vet? Um, should we walk the horse, which is another therapy for a colicky horse uh, to keep them moving, to keep the guts mobile or prevent rolling? So is that something that we should do, shouldn't do? How do we know whether to do that? What are some things the owner could do? Now, every vet is different as far as they want you to do. And like I said, I have a small practice where everyone's pretty close. So that's where I would rather they just come rather than have you give banamine and potentially mask something that can be more serious later. And I feel like I get better outcomes with treating sooner than later. But there's been times where I've been caught up in another emergency and I have a client call with a colic and they do have some banamine on hand. And so I'll tell them, Go ahead and give that dose of anamine because it's going to be a little bit before I can get to you and I want your horse comfortable. And so in that interim time, if the horse is trying to throw itself down, do a lot of rolling, is really, really restless, then I'll recommend walking up. If they are laying quietly, I'm okay with them laying quietly because I just think about the fact that like if I had a really bad stomach ache and somebody was like, get up, walk it <laughs> off, let's go. I'm like, mm for the horse <laughs> right. so because I find too a lot of them when they lay down they'll kind of get in that fetal position or they'll be sternal and kind of cramped or they'll lay to their side and then when they get up they'll often pass a lot of gas and mm. so that's where I'm a I'm okay with them down as long as they're laying quietly if they're doing a lot of flip-flopping then I tell them to get them up and walk them yeah and then my rule is if pain makes them comfortable in an hour then you can try monitoring them, but don't feed them any hay for 24 hours. So no dry hay for 24 hours if you have to give banamine for a colic. I recommend grazing, mashes, anything to get higher water content into them. And then if they're not back to normal an hour after the banamine, then I definitely need to come see them. 
So that's where the occasional, or I'll have clients that are like out in the woods riding or something like that. And their horse becomes colicky, or like I said, the few times where I can't get quickly, but I prefer to go sooner than later, but other vets will often tell you, try a dose of anamine and see what you get because some horses respond to just that. It's a non steroidal anti-inflammatory. It acts a lot like ibuprofen does for you and I. So oftentimes it can be enough to make that horse comfortable. But it is a medication that you have to get through your vet anyways. You can't buy banamine over the counter. And so it's also a good idea to let the vet know you have colic symptoms and ask, because every situation can be unique. And so really having at least a phone discussion with the vet that you got the banamine from would help you know whether to get that horse treated sooner than sooner or later. Yes. Okay. So, Absolutely. so what are some of the strategies that you recommend? What are some of the number one things you tell your clients uh, how to prevent colic or management issues that maybe can help avoid <laughs> potential colics? Like there's some colics where um, like you said, a uh, um, uh, benign tumor, uh, different growths in the abdominal cavity, or we didn't really talk about intraliths, but that's another possible cause of colic. Mm. And there are certain things that are going to be surgical no matter what, that it's not really a horse care or feeding program thing. It just will happen. And so what are some of the things we can do to avoid colic in our horses as much as possible? So the number one thing is feed a good quality hay. That hands down is what helps the most. Um, Cause I said, most of my impactions that I treat are horses that are being fed Tifton or coastal hay, which is a very, very fine hay. And often it is um, fed to the horse as a free choice from a large role because it's very cheap and easy to do. And especially if you have a situation where you don't have much grass on your property and you want to keep some hay in front of them to nibble on at their, their leisure. And they can work if you manage those correctly too. And that's where like the number one thing I always tell people, I'm like, if you're going to feed coastal rolls free choice, the first thing is never let them run out. And the horses waste the bottom third to quarter of the roll. Basically, if they step on the hay, they're not going to eat it. And so there's always waste. And some people want to leave it till the horse cleans it all up. They're not going to do it. So basically, if you're waiting for them to clean it up, you're making your horse go two or three days with very limited amounts of hay. And then you come and bring in a nice fresh roll and plop it down and your horse sticks their head in the middle of it and doesn't come up for air for 12 hours and eats and eats and eats and then gets an impaction because they've gone two or three days with eating minimal amounts of hay because what was left, they didn't like it. So they're not going to eat it. And then they gorge on the fresh hay. So that's the number one thing is never, ever let it run all the way out. As soon as it starts getting low, get the next fresh one in there. And then I usually recommend giving a nice soupy, oily bran mash or adding extra salt to their food to make them thirsty and make them drink for the first two or three days whenever you add a new roll, because that encourages and, water intake. And the, um, the tropical grasses like um, coastal hay and Tifton are sort of regional to the Southeast United States. But even when I was in Colorado, if you're putting out a large bale for the horse to feed off of and you get down to the last bit of it, once they walk on it or poop on it, or if it's humid, wet conditions and the hay gets moldy, they're not going to eat it. And I think that's a good strategy in any area of the country where they're, where they're feeding off of a large bale. Yeah. If you're doing any kind of free choice off of a large bale, because a lot of people too will feed the large alfalfa blocks. Mm-hmm blocks, which are great. And you typically don't get as many colics with them, although they can contribute more to gas colics because the alfalfa is a little bit more rich and gas producing. So you do run a risk with that, but I see far more impaction colics with coastal and the fine free choice fed than I do with the alfalfa free choice fed. 
Um, but with any of them, just don't let them run out. Always get that new one out there before they get down to the bottom. Well, and when I talked with colic surgeons down in South Florida, um, they said that the coastal hay was a big reason for colics and colic surgeries, mostly because it's a tropical grass and when it dries, the hay is so thin that they can't masticate it properly. So it's, it's a bit of a colic risk. Some horses live on it their whole life without a problem. But the way it was explained to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that it was the thinness of the hay, that they mm -hmm. didn't masticate it properly. And so in the digestive system, it could literally kind of ball up like angel hair pasta ball in and create an impaction in the gut, especially if they were not drinking enough. Yeah, it's typically associated with the decrease in water intake. So as long as that horse is drinking really well, those longer fibers can get through if there's enough moisture. But as soon as they become remotely dehydrated, it'll get stuck. And like I had one client where they had gone riding in the woods all day and then went to a restaurant to eat Threw her hay, uh, threw her horse a flake of coastal hay while they were eating, got home and it was colicky. And so it was just, it had gone riding all day, didn't drink enough water before she fed her the fine hay. And then I'm meeting them at the house, running fluids to the horse to get them hydrated. And then things got moving again and it turned out okay. But it's just one of those where some of the management tricks can contribute to whether or not your horses get colicky. And I tell people like one thing I do with my critters is the first thing I do when I go to feed them is look and see how much water they drink that day. And if for any reason their water intake was a little less than I expected, I give them less hay. They just don't get quite as much. And that'll usually help prevent it and keep things moist and moving through their bowel nicely. Right. And so water management, knowing how much water the horse is roughly drinking is a huge part of trying to prevent colic. So when we rely on automatic waterers that don't have a measuring gauge, we really don't know how much they're drinking. So having buckets and troughs or a, um, a gauge on an automatic waterer all help us know that the horse is drinking an average amount for that individual less than average or a lot more than average, which can also indicate some problems. Yes. So, and then adding mineral oil um, to feed, how does mineral oil specifically help with, with colic or digestive issues as opposed to like corn oil or olive oil or something like that? So all the other oils, they can break down and utilize. So like if you're trying to get some more weight on your horse, you can feed them corn oil and their large intestine and the cecum is going to break down that oil and utilize it. Mineral oil, they can't break it down. So it's definitely, it's just a laxative. It's a cathartic. And so if you, if you feed it, or if I put it through a tube, it has to come out the back end. And so for me, I use it, we used to think that a lot of mineral oil was the best way to go for impaction colics. But over the last few years, they've been doing a lot of studies and they're looking at actually more water is better. And so if I have to treat a horse a second time, I'll often you know, pass the nasal gastric tube. If I don't get back what I put in earlier, I'll give them a full bucket of water. And I rarely give them more than about a third of a gallon of mineral oil. Whereas when I first got out of school, I would often give a gallon of mineral oil. And we find that the mineral oil is best for your gas colics. It can sometimes change the surface tension and help break down the gas. And it can help with coating the intestines so the sand can move through better if you have a primary sand colic. But for my impaction colics, I'm using just that little bit of mineral oil as what I call a marker, where I'm going to look for it at the back end. And, and that's when I know it's for... the GI tract is clear because the oil came out the back end. And in a normal horse, their GI tract will pass oil within 12 to 24 hours. I've often had colics where it's taken three to five days. And so my rule is no hay for the first 24 hours. And then if they're doing really well, I do very limited hay until I see oil. And so oil's not coming through. I know there's an issue in there where we've got to be judicious with our hay and make sure we don't 
stack things up and make the colic worse. Right. And you can see the oil actually come through the shiny, oily surface on the poops. So you just basically check the poops. And when they're really shiny, you know that <laughs> oil's coming through. One thing to not get confused by, though, is sometimes when the poops are moving slow through the GI tract, they'll actually get coated in mucus. And some people think a mucus coated poo is an oily poo, and it's not. And the way to tell the difference is break the poo ball. And if it's mucus, it'll have this little filmy coating on it that you can like see that looks like mucus. And if it's oil, it'll just be shiny and there's no mucus on the outside. And so I tell people to usually just look at the anus. If their anus is shiny, the oil came through. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All this talk about poop and colic. Uh, it's what it's what horse owners obsess over. We're always checking our right. horses poop, always checking our horses water. And then having obviously having salt blocks or mineral blocks or salt available for the horse free choice. Would would that be preferable over adding salt to the food or is that more of an individual, maybe even environmental consideration? How would you how would you decide just to put out salt blocks or to actually put salt in the food? I like to allow free choice with salt intake because some horses just love it and they go to town on it. And to me, that's making them thirsty, keeping them drinking. So if they want it, they can have it. And then I utilize adding salt or electrolytes to the food for things like sudden cold snap or we're getting big weather changes, or it's been just crazy, crazy hot. And you never notice your horse has been sweating a lot. Never hurts to add a little bit more. They're not going to get hypertension like we do from eating okay. too much. <laughs> I was going to ask, can we give them too much? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eat an insane amount to get hypertension. Okay. So I utilize it a little strategically like that. Cause in Florida, our weather's so nice the majority of the time that when we get our cold snaps, I swear Florida horses are like, I'm not putting my lips in that cold water. <laughs> I know. I'm going to drink. And so one of the things you can do is put salt in the food to encourage them to drink because it's salty, just like you're eating some chips, you're going to reach for something to drink. Or even wet their food, make their food, their regular meal, a little bit of a mash just to get some yep. more moisture in them with some added salt. Yes, that was, and, and I think all states can have big temperature fluctuations. In Florida, it's hot, 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 and then it can drop 30, 40 degrees very quickly. And that's kind of our colic season, isn't it? Yeah. When we're getting those big fluctuations in temperature. Yeah. And up north, it was interesting when people use a water heater in their water for places that get frozen water, which we don't get in Florida, our buckets rarely freeze. So we don't use water heaters, but in areas where there's a real winter, the horses sometimes will drink more in the winter because the water is warm. Mm -hmm. And so they drink just fine and need plenty of hay. But when somebody moves to Florida and they're sort of on that routine of feed a lot of extra hay and don't worry about the water intake, when the weather gets cold, the water gets cold in the bucket. And I find that the horses just don't want to drink cold water. Yep. And so if we're not heating our water in cold weather, the horses are likely not going to drink it. And so a lot of people who first moved to Florida feed a whole bunch of hay and have a colic their first winter. Yep. Because the horses just won't drink the cold water as well. No. Nope. And actually our groundwater is warmer than the water in the bucket that's been in the freezing temperature overnight. So a good trick is to dump that water in the morning and give them fresh water from the groundwater. Right. <laughs> so yeah. then they're like, oh, I'm going to drink that. Ah, good idea. And what about um, barometric pressure? I will hear things about barometric pressure changes like say a hurricane or um, severe weather changes, big storm fronts coming through. Does barometric pressure actually affect a horse having abdominal pain? Um, anecdotally, I will say that I do get colics around big changes in barometric pressure. I can't say if it's been scientifically researched that 
it's definitive that that's the cause, but knowing how it can affect your own joints and things like that, that it wouldn't surprise me that changes in barometric pressure might contribute to gas colics or things like that. Okay. Or maybe, maybe even a potential displacement and stuff. But like I said, anecdotally, I do typically see a little cluster of colics around big barometric pressure changes. It's not uncommon. All right. And temperature changes as well. Um, like for some horses, when they acclimate to Florida heat and we get a cold front, I find I blanket as a, as a colic prevention, I throw blankets on my horses early in Florida compared to living anywhere else. Because again, maybe the temperature fluctuation, they're not drinking as much, they're trying to eat more, but also is if they get suddenly really hot or really cold, could that have any influence over colic? I'd say the biggest influence would be the water intake, that that's what it's going to affect. And then that in turn will lead to colic. Okay. Because of action. So it's kind of one of those where it's not that their body can't handle the temperature change and it causes like the intestine to spasm or something like that. It's more that it's going to influence their water intake. Okay. Got it. So, any, <laughs> um, and what about parasites? What about like treating for either doing fecal exams or regular deworming program? Or if we did nothing about parasites, would that have any impact on, on colic situations? Uh, yeah, parasites can um, affect their GI tract, and we don't see as many of the issues with like the ascrids and strongyles because of all the good dewormers we have. And they actually kind of discovered equine tapeworms through colic surgery because they don't shed like the dog and cat ones where they're picking those up from fleas. Horses get a shorter, broader tapeworm that lives where the small intestine dumps into the large intestine from the ileocecal area. And we now have the dewormers like Equimax, Quest Plus, and Zymectrin Gold that are specific for those tapeworms. Um, but those don't shed eggs. And so University of Florida has recommended that in order to help slow down our resistance that we're building to certain dewormers, because like a single dose of Panicure has about a 70% effective rate now, about 30% of the strong giles are resistant to it so it's usually recommended to do a double dose at least if not a panicure power pack um, and not just use that single dose panicure but uf recommends doing fecal analyses um, about two to three times a year and then deworming based on the fecal and then once a year regardless of the fecal result in spring or fall give one of the tapeworm dewormers because they're picking it up from a mite that lives in the pasture and there's no way to detect them on tests. I, I believe I saw some research where they're looking at a oral saliva swab to try to diagnose tapeworms. And I'm not sure that's going anywhere, but there is some research that they're working on to try to diagnose parasite load through a swab test from saliva. Oh, interesting. That should be interesting if that works. But so what I, most of my clients, I have some that just stick to the old routine of doing rotational deworming. Um, but a lot of my clients now are doing this strategic where we just do fecals, look and see what their loads are. And if they don't have any parasites, then don't deworm at that time, unless they're due for their annual tapeworm deworming. And you don't want to overuse the Quest Plus Symmetrin Gold and um, Equimax, because we don't want to build resistance to that prosy quantel that's in it that's treating the tapeworms. So, and that's so where you, I, you recommend once a year or twice a year? Once a year. Once a year for tapes. Yeah, because yeah. even if we're doing regular fecal exams, the tapes won't show up. Right. Okay, I think that's all my questions. Um, awesome. And it is, it's a super in, important topic for anyone in charge of horse care or any horse owner because colic, oh, that was the other thing um, that we didn't really talk about is the fact that horses cannot throw up. Right. So 
when you do a gastro nasal gar uh, a tube, it's like the first thing you're checking for is what would be vomit in a human or a cat or a dog, it, a horse is not going to vomit. And this is why sometimes um, abdominal pain can can really become life threatening for horses. And so when what's kind of describe your typical colic call, what do you go and do? And somebody, I call you on the phone and say, I think my horse is colicking. You can come right away. So I don't give banamine. I don't need to walk the horse. You're going to be here soon. And so you show up and what's your routine that you go through? So the first thing I try to do is get a heart rate without giving any drugs. Some horses are so violently painful that I've got to get some sedation in them first. But typically I try to get up to them, listen to their heart and get a heart rate and then listen for gut sounds, see if I can hear anything. And what's the heart rate going to tell you? The degree of pain that they're in. So normal resting heart rate in a horse is anywhere between about 20 and 44 beats a minute. For your kind of low grade mild colics, they may have a normal heart rate or it may go up to maybe about 55 to 60. And those are the ones that they'll typically respond pretty nicely to some banamine and sedation and my treatment. And then they're usually doing okay after that. If their heart rate is greater than 60, then um, I know that there's something a little bit more serious going on. And if they're way up there in the 80, 90, 100 range, then the thing that that does that changes what I do is immediately they get sedation and they get a tube up the nose into the stomach because that's where they're, when the heart rate's really, really high, that tells me that there's something really painful going on and we run the risk of rupture. And so I wanna get that nasal gastric tube in as soon as I can. If their heart rate is in the lower end, then what I usually do is give them about, depending on their size, so like average size horse gets one and a half cc's of xylazine or rompum and 10 cc's of banamine IV, and then I do a rectal. And what and do those drugs do? So the banamine, like I said, is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So it's working just like ibuprofen does. It um, decreases inflammation and takes away some of that pain and it can also reduce a fever, but it's mild. It's just like your eye, you know, you don't, you're not gonna take ibuprofen for a broken arm. You want something stronger. right? And Oh, but the banamine can be nice for those mild colics. And then xylazine is what's called an alpha-2 agonist. So it's acting on various receptors in the body. So it acts as a sedative. It acts as a muscle relaxer. And it has some anti-inflammatory um, factors to it as well. And so that's what's going to get that horse a little bit more sleepy and easier to work with. So like if I get there and that heart rate's way up or that horse is throwing themselves on the ground, that's the first drug I want to get into them. And depending on their pain level, I'll sometimes give them a little butorphanol as well, which is a morphine derivative. So, and I find now I'm doing it, I used to do it IV, but we found that it can give a little better pain relief for a longer duration if given sub Q. Mm. So oftentimes I'll do a CC and a half of xylazine IV to, to two and a half, depending on the size of the horse, the degree of pain. And then I give them a little Torb sub Q if they're really painful. But basically I like to kind of stick with my same recipe because I want to see how that horse responds. Every horse is different, but I know my kind of typical responses to it. They're like, I'm going to get a good 20 to many, 20 to 30 minutes of sedation from that xylazine. And so if I've got a horse that's coming out of it in 10 minutes, that tells me that there's something more painful going on than what that xylazine can treat. And so that's one of my kind of indicators that this might be a surgical situation or it's just such a bad impaction. They're so painful. So then I go and do a rectal and on the rectal, what I'm doing is I'm just reaching into their rectum, going forward. I'm going to run my hand over the bladder and see, is that full? Is it small? Can I feel anything in it? In a mare, I'm gonna quick run it over the uterus. Does that uterus feel like it's a normal size uterus for a non-pregnant mare? Um, and then I go forward and I'm reaching to the left to feel for the pelvic flexure, which is the portion of the large colon that comes back and flips back on itself. 
And it's also a point where it narrows tremendously. It's going from a diameter of about 10 to 12 inches down to about four inches when it makes that turn. And it's the favorite place for impactions. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna feel that pelvic flexure, feel that the ingesta in it is soft. So like if there's, if I can feel the food that's being digested in there, I want it to kind of give and be spongy like um, bread dough, or is it firmer than that? Like kind of get into stale bread or really firm where they're really super dehydrated and have very thick impaction there. I'm also feeling for the amount of gas and is that pelvic flexure where it's supposed to be? Because sometimes too, if they have a displacement, I'll reach in on that left side and I can't find the pelvic flexure. And it's something that I should be able to feel normally. And so if I can't feel it, that tells me it's not where it's supposed to be. I might have a displacement or it could in a big horse just be really low in the abdomen and I'm just unable to palpate it. I then feel to the right side of the abdomen where the cecum lives to see, is it filled with air? Is it got a good doughy ingestion, um, ingesta, or is it getting too firm? Sometimes you can feel what we call tight bands, where if that colon is kind of pushed off to the side and not where it's supposed to be, the bands that run along it are these kind of fibrous bands. Sometimes you can feel the pressure on those and be like, okay, I've got a tight band with gas distension in the right quadrant that should be in the left. And so that's something that might be surgical. But sometimes they can get kind of like a little temporary displacement with an impaction and you get the impaction going and moved out of the way and you can get that colon to go back where it wants to be. That's a lot in the rectal exam. And that's where you pull out the long gloves that go all the way up to the elbow or the shoulder. And the thing that I don't want to feel is small intestine. On a normal horse, I cannot palpate small intestine. So if I reach in there and feel what feels like loops of sausage, that's distended small intestine that's come up to my area where I can feel it. And that's bad. Mm. So that small intestine is distended, which is not a good thing. And then on my way out, I pull out my hand. I always look at my hand to make sure everything looks fine. There's no blood on it. There's nothing funky, like a bunch of mucus. There's no parasites. I've had that before. That's not fun. Mm. It's on the hand. Um, And then I'll usually try to get a little bit of poop if I can, and then I'll invert that glove, add water and check for sand and see how much sand I have. Cause there's some where it's super obvious when you're pulling the poop out, there's just tons and tons of sand in it. But I've had a few where there's a lot more sand than I think there is. And the water test is always a great way to check. Right. Which horse owners can do too. You just take some fresh balls of poop that you don't have to actually take out of the rectum. You could pick up in the stall. <laughs> And you put it in a baggie with some water. And when the poop dissolves, all the sand gathers at the bottom of the bag. And that's how you can check for sand, even Mm -hmm. if your horse isn't colicking, and decide if you need one of those sand clear supplements for your horse, which is, it's a great colic prevention technique. You you know, horse owners can check for sand anytime with a fresh poop and a baggie. Okay, so then you go after the rectal exam, then you start looking at the, at the, at putting the tube in. Yeah, and, and at the- this point too, I, I don't know if I mentioned in my physical exam, I also take their temperature because fever and colic is very uncommon. And so if you have fever with a colic, it can be a little bit more concerning that you might have something else going on in there. Um, Because typically horses will run a low temperature or a low normal temperature when they're colicky, which will be down in that that kind of 97 to 99 range. And a fever is over 101.2 or 101.5, sorry. And so if like 104 temperature with a colic, um, I find that very concerning. And then the other thing I look at is their gum color. A nice normal pink is what we're looking for. Most of my mild colics, they'll have a little bit of blanching where it looks more white and that's from the pain. It's just like you or I, if you smash your foot or something, you blanch and because of all the stress closes all your vessels from the hypertension. And so their gums will get more pale. I'll also push on the tissue and see how long it takes to do a capillary refill time. Because when I push on it, it should turn white. I let go and it should refill in less than two seconds. 
And so if it is a little on the pink side, I push, it becomes white. It should be pink again within two. If it takes longer than that, then that tells me they're dehydrated. And then if they have purple gums or really dark red gums, all that's very, very bad. Mm. And that needs IV fluids right away because that's a sign of toxicity or um, severe dehydration. So okay. then I usually put a twitch on them for the tubing because I, we don't want to do a bloody nose. Right. And those usually happen when the horse is throwing their head. So they usually get a nose twitch on and then I pass the nasal gastric tube up the nostril. They have to swallow it into their esophagus. It goes down to their stomach. If I get what's called spontaneous reflux, where now the vomit that couldn't come up is all of a sudden shooting out the tube. Mm -hmm. And that tells me I've got something going on in the small intestine and it's not moving the fluid out of their stomach like it's supposed to, and it's backing up. And that's a horse that's at risk of rupturing. So I always let everything drain out. That's going to drain out on its own. But I would say that happens. I actually have probably what I've been a vet 20 years. And I think that's happened to me three times where I've gotten spontaneous reflux like that. Mm. You, I have to pump in some water and create a siphon and get the fluid to come back out. And sometimes I'll get back more than I put in. And so in those horses, I don't give them water or mineral oil through the tube. They get IV fluids. So we either do that in the field or they take them up to the hospital, depending on what the owner wants to do and run IV fluids there. If I get back less or the same amount than what I put in to do the lavage. And like I said, I was looking at smell, color, food content, what's going, you know, why is this stomach contents not moving out like it should? And how foul does it smell? Cause usually if it's been sitting with grain, it'll have a really nasty sour smell. And then I just kind of lavage it out. Some horses too, they'll have just a bunch of hay in there because they can get a stomach impaction that can happen as well too, where their pylorus is not, it's not moving out through the pylorus into the small intestine like it should. And they literally have a belly full of hay. Mm. And those, horses, one of the things that can help is actually um, giving them Coca-Cola through the really? nasal gastric. And the uh, acidity and the sugars of the Coke help break down the hay faster and get it to move out. So that that's another trick there as well. But you, so you're kind of looking at how much hay am I getting out of this stomach? And I'll say that like usually horses that are on the free choice um, coastal rolls, I get a lot of hay. Mm. And I just kind of keep lavaging until I get that down to minimal amounts. And then I give them water and a little mineral oil, pull that tube and then see what they're going to do. Mm. That's kinda, and, and so uh, would you say a good percentage of your colics are just a one visit deal and little follow up? Or would you say most colics are going to require two visits or possibly surgery or what's more common? Just the one visit. The one, one visit. Yeah, that's by far more common than having to do the multiple visits and stuff. So by the owner sort of recognizing the symptoms early, getting on the phone with the vet early and starting to follow instructions. And even if it's not a big deal at the time and it is only one visit, you're potentially diverting away from a life-threatening complication to the same problem. So it's to be taken really seriously and hoping that it's not more than a single visit and the horse clears up and the digestion is back to normal. Yeah. Yeah. No, I often have people get very apologetic that they call when the horse is colicking. And by the time I get there, it's comfortable and grazing because it had what I call the fart stuck sideways. <laughs> I was fine. And I said, no, no, I'd rather come and have a happy horse than a colicky horse. So it's yes. no to come check them out. And in those cases, I usually just do a physical exam, look them over. And if everything looks great, like they're well hydrated, their heart rate's totally normal. I can hear gut sounds, their gum color's good. Then I'm okay with watching and not doing anything further. If there's anything that's just a little bit off, then I usually recommend that we go ahead and at least pass a nasal gastric tube, give them some water that way, and just make mm. sure that they get a, you know, a bucket of water. So it all kind of depends on the horse and stuff, but um, I've had a few where I show up and just do a physical and all is well and away I go. And even if it's that mild, 
would you still recommend maybe taking the hay away for that night or that day, giving soaked feed, even if it's the normal feed, and just making sure they have more moisture in their food because they had symptoms, even though the symptoms were mild? Would that yeah. still be the best thing to do? Absolutely. Okay. Because yeah. like you said, a lot of colics are going to be really related to hydration. And so feeding more dry food could make something worse. We're feeding wet food and taking away the hay, letting them have green grass um, would help increase the hydration, reduce the chance of colic. Correct. Great. Okay. Well, I think we will have to wrap it up there. We went quite a quite extensively into the topic of colic. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that because especially new horse owners, it is a bit of a mystery and they don't really know it's serious until they can't figure out what's wrong with their horse. And sometimes it's, it gets later and later and can become life-threatening where it didn't need to be. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Number Thank you. Indicate if your horse doesn't eat, there's something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Eat like a horse. I mean, that is there for a reason. We say that for a reason. And when a horse goes off their food, everybody panics. Yep. Yeah, that is not good. Something is wrong. Something's wrong if the horse doesn't have an appetite. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I look forward to having you back to talk about your other two uh, new horse owner lectures, which is on laminitis. Mm -hmm. And what do we say? Corneal ulcers. Corneal. So learning about colic, laminitis, and corneal ulcers are imperative for every mm -hmm. horse owner to learn about just to keep their horse healthy and safe. So I look forward to having you again. Thank you so much for doing the podcast with me, Sissy. And <laughs> okay, I'll see you later. Thanks everybody for joining us. I'll see you next time. Bye.